and welcome to our service today at the First Presbyterian Church of Duquesne, Pennsylvania. I'm Pastor Judy Slater, our musician is Matt Demas, and our liturgist today is Mary Yearsley. There is a bulletin online if you would like to join in with the unison and responsive readings. Uh, we will not be worshiping in the sanctuary this week, but starting next week, November 1st, our hope is to worship every Sunday in the sanctuary for those who feel comfortable gathering. We will continue our online services throughout this pandemic. So for those who feel more comfortable staying home and being safe, we honor that and we're glad that you joined in to worship with us online. Next Sunday, November 1st, is Remembrance Sunday. So if you're worshiping at home next week and would like to have a candle ready in remembrance of your loved ones, we will be doing that during the service. Let us join together in heart and worship God. Let us do the call to worship, which is from Psalm 90. God, we know you are with us. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You have showered your love upon all generations since the beginning of time. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Guide us now through this time and into the weeks ahead. From everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Let us worship God. Let us join together in prayer. Lord, we remember the many ways in which you have helped and saved us from generation to generation. Be with us this day as we listen for your word for us in our time. Touch our hearts with your healing mercy and give us the faith and courage to follow you. In Jesus' name, amen. Our times remind us just how much we need reconciliation. In order to reconcile with God, with each other, and even with ourselves, let us join together in the prayer of confession. Jesus taught us to love you, O God, with all our heart. We confess that we are not always loyal to you. Jesus taught us to love you, O God, with all our soul. We confess that we often long to have our own way. Jesus taught us to love you, O God, with all our mind. We confess that our thoughts are seldom so pure. Jesus taught us to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We confess our preference to put ourselves first and to put limits on your love. God, have mercy upon us as we make our confession. Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive our sin. Herein lies our pardon. In God's love for us, God was pleased to reconcile all creation through the blood of Christ. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are loved, we are accepted, and we are forgiven.
Old Testament lesson is from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verses 1 and 4 through 12. Listen for and hear the word of God. Then Moses climbed Mount Nebo from the plains of Moab to the top of Pisgah, across from Jericho. There the Lord showed him the whole land, from Gilead to Dan. Then the Lord said to him, This is the land I promise on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when I said, I will give it to your descendants. I have let you see it with your eyes, but you will not cross over into it. And Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in Moab, as the Lord had said. He buried him in Moab in the valley opposite Beth Peor, but to this day no one knows where the grave is. Moses was a hundred and twenty years old when he died, yet his eyes were not weak, nor his strength gone. The Israelites grieved for Moses in the plains of Moab thirty days, until the time of weeping and mourning was over. Now Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom, because Moses had laid his hands on him. So the Israelites listened to him and did what the Lord had commanded Moses. Since then, no prophet has risen in Israel like Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face, who did all those signs and wonders the Lord sent him to do in Egypt to Pharaoh and to all his officials and to his whole land. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Our New Testament lesson is from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 34 through 40. Hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the Pharisees got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I read a story about a farmer who had an excellent wheat crop each year. In fact, his wheat crop won the prize at the county fair for the best wheat crop around. A local reporter was interviewing him and found out that the farmer would give seeds from last year's wheat crop to the neighboring farmers. And the reporter was a little surprised by that. And he said, why would you give your prized wheat seed to neighboring farmers when they're your competitors at the county fair. And the farmer said, well, the wind picks up pollen from the growing wheat and carries it from field to field. If my neighbor's grain is inferior, then cross-pollination will steadily degrade the quality of all the wheat including mine. So by giving good seed to my neighbors, I help my crop as well. This is a great lesson for life. We live in a time of divisions. We, we human beings find all kinds of ways to divide. We divide ourselves by country, by ethnicity, by race, by neighborhood all sorts of ways we have to create divisions among us. And we often feel like competitors with each other, that if someone else does well, then somehow that takes away from my welfare. Well, when we consider the wheat example, the best way for us to live 
would be to make sure everybody is doing well all around us and then we would do better as well. So it's a situation where if people of color had equity in our society and were given the same opportunities to succeed, it wouldn't take away from our society, it would build up our society and all would be better. I think this is what Jesus is talking about when he was asked, what are the greatest commandments? What is the greatest commandment he was asked? And he said to love God and the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. I think Jesus was trying to show us that God did not intend for this to be a dog-eat-dog -dog world. We're intended to lift each other up in our humanity. God has a better way for us than divisions. It is a way of reconciliation. Jesus came to reconcile us with God, with each other, and even with ourselves. This Sunday is Reformation Sunday, when we remember that in the 1500s, there were people like Martin Luther and John Calvin and the other reformers who took a look at the state of the church and considered how people were understanding what it meant to be a Christian, and they cried out for change. They cried out for change because things had gotten off track. People thought they had to earn their salvation, either by doing good works or paying money. And the Bible, however, says that we are saved by faith alone in Jesus Christ. And this was important because up until this time, the Bible wasn't readily available to people, not even priests in the ministry, because there weren't that many copies, but up until then you had to copy them by hand, and some couldn't read. But now the printing press has come into being, and so copies of the Bible are being printed and people are reading it. And the reformers read the Bible and said, wait a minute, it's by faith alone that we are saved. I think every generation, we should consider the question that the reformers thought. What is the state of the church? And what are people's understanding of being a Christian? Are we on track or have we gotten off track? One of our garden folks, who's not a member of our church, she doesn't go to any church, said to me this past year, I think I know you well enough to know that if I come to your church, you won't hurt me. That pierced my heart, that there was somebody out there and I know there are many others who think that the church will hurt them if they come. But Jesus' commandment was for us was to love God and to love others. I think that for us, and probably for Christians of all times, it is Jesus' instructions on these commandments that are most important for us to take a look at and see how we're doing to love God and to love others. How are we doing with this? This is our purpose and our calling. When people come, do they feel welcomed and accepted or do they feel judged? When people see us, do they think of love? These are people who love God and love others. Or do they think of us as people who exclude others? No matter what our circumstances, no matter how we find ourselves, where we find ourselves, Jesus' instructions to us, the most important things, he said, is to love God 
and love others. Whether it's in the middle of a pandemic, whomever the President of the United States happens to be, whatever circumstances we find ourselves, our job as God's people is to love God and to love others. This is the kingdom of God in our midst. This is where we are called to dwell. As Christians, this is our home, to dwell in God's love and to love God and to love others. We may want the world to be perfect. We may want our country to be perfect. We may want our lives to be perfect. But our job is not to have perfect lives. Our job is to love, to love God and to love others. For this life is a journey. We are on a journey in this life and time marches on. The older I get, the more I realize that is true. We are but a small part of history. We are but a small part of God's kingdom work and God's kingdom plan. We are supposed to do the best we can while we are here, which doesn't mean we don't work to make the world a better place. We should vote. We should fight injustice. We should take care of the earth. We should be doing all of these things. We should be striving to make things better, to make things better in the world for our time and for the generations to come. But in the end, God's plan and purpose for creation, God's plan and purpose for humanity is bigger than us, and it is bigger than our time. It is bigger than we can even imagine. We're reminded of this as we read about the end of life for Moses. We've been following the story of Moses throughout the fall. We've seen the God speak to Moses through the burning bush, telling him to go back to Egypt. Moses reluctantly goes back to Egypt, deals with Pharaoh and all the plagues, finally leads the people out of Egypt, encounters the Red Sea that God parts for them to walk through, and then all the complaining in the wilderness and Moses speaking to God and God providing manna and quail and water from the rock for them to live. And then Moses receives the Ten Commandments, sort of the guide for life that God has given us so that we can get along in society. And then, of course, the golden calf that happened while Moses was getting the Ten Commandments. All of this is happening, and Moses was in the wilderness for 40 years with these people. Now, I'm not exactly sure how long it takes to actually walk from Egypt to Israel, to Egypt to the Promised Land. Some commentators say it's as short as 11 days. Others say three weeks. So it's a big group. Maybe it would have taken them a few months, not 40 years. Moses was with these people for 40 years, wandering in the wilderness until God led them to the promised land. Commentators say it took 40 years to get Egypt out of their systems. When you think about it, the adults that left Egypt probably weren't alive 40 years later. It's the next generation that is going to see the promised land. And in our story today, God tells Moses he will not go to the promised land with them. His purpose, his journey is over. God lets him see it, but he is not the one to go with them. 
Aaron, his brother, has already died. And like I said, probably most of the adults that left Egypt with them, it's a new generation. And Moses blesses Joshua, and Joshua leads the people to the promised land. We're on a journey in this life. It's not about arriving. It's about being on the journey and what we do with it. How we travel with God and with each other. Moses doesn't get to go with them as he only sees it from the distance because this was not his calling. This was not his purpose. His purpose was to lead them out of Egypt through the wilderness to the promised land. And now it's Joshua's turn to take over with the next generation. Loving God and loving others is our calling and our purpose for our time and for whatever stage of life we're in, for what, wherever we are on this journey, loving God and loving others is our calling and our purpose. There is a bigger picture, a greater plan, a fuller experience of God's kingdom that will come. The promised land, the land of milk and honey, they called it. It was a land of peace and prosperity for all. Isn't that what we long for? Peace and prosperity for all. We are on a journey in this life, and that's where we're headed, to the kingdom of God, where there is peace and prosperity for all. But it is a journey that is bigger than us and bigger than our time. People have prepared the way for us. Those who came before us have prepared the way in the church, in our families, in society. People have prayed for us. I talked last week about the prayer group that prayed for us and, and we're experiencing the answers of those prayers even now. Maybe it's our turn to pray. Maybe it's our turn to pray, not just for our now, for the ministry we have now, not just for our life situation now, or our families now, that is all very important. But maybe it is our turn to pray for the years to come, the generations to come, the journey that will come in our church, in our families, from generation to generation, in our world. Maybe it's our turn to leave a legacy of love and goodness, loving God and loving others. It's our turn for our faithfulness and for the future generations. It is our turn to live, to love, and to pray. What legacy are we creating from generation, this generation, for generations to come? That's the question of the Reformation. And so that's a question for us today. What legacy are we leaving? What legacy are we leaving the community through the ministry of our church? What legacy are we leaving in the next generation as we love them and nurture them in the church and in our families? What legacy are we leaving the world? Will it be a better place? because we were here. Will there be more love, love of God and love of each other because of our journeys? It may not be the land of milk and honey that we are in right now. In fact, it's been a pretty difficult year. We long for that peace and prosperity that is promised in the promised land. But we have a vision of it. 
like Moses, standing and looking at the promised land. In Jesus Christ, God has given us a vision of what can be, of what will be someday. We need to strive toward that vision, and we need to share that vision with a world that needs hope right now. We are on a journey, the journey of life. It's not perfect. There are ups and downs, smooth sailing and difficult roads. But through it all, we have been given the tasks of loving God and loving each other because we know that in Jesus Christ, God loves us. Let us pray. God, we do ask for your help for the journey. As we continue our individual journeys, as we continue our journey as your people, as we continue our journey in this world, we ask that you guide us, that you protect us, that you lift us up, and that your spirit fills us with your love so powerfully that that love spills over into the world now and for generations to come. In Jesus' name, amen.
please join me in the affirmation of faith, a statement of what we believe. We believe God who is love. We believe in Jesus Christ who shows us what love can mean in our lives. We believe in the Holy Spirit who is present whenever love is present between us. We believe in faith as our trust in the never failing love of God. We believe in hope, which only a loving God makes possible. We believe in life having meaning, which becomes evident when we love and let ourselves be loved. In order to love God, we must love one another. In order to love one another, we must accept ourselves. So we believe in love as the only way of relating to God, to each other, and even to ourselves. Amen. Let us join together for the morning prayer. Waken our hearts, O Lord, our God. Make them ever watchful to serve you and your purposes. Trouble us with the smallness of our vision and work. Trouble us with the greatness of your command to make disciples of all nations. Trouble us with your great love for sinners and our own slowness to make you our greatest love. Trouble us with the brevity of our lives and time, the brevity of our talent and treasures not invested in eternity. Comfort us by drawing us to yourself with the cords of your unfailing mercy. Comfort us, O Lord, with the assurance of our salvation and unending glory with you when we suffer and are afflicted. Rekindle in us a renewed desire for the coming of your glorious kingdom, when all wrongs will be made right, when everything that is broken will be made whole, and when we will trade a cross for a crown. With confidence in your love and in your presence, we bring to you our concerns we continue to pray for the end of this pandemic, and we pray for all who are suffering because of it. We continue to pray for our children and the school situations. Please keep everyone safe and help learning happen. We pray for those dehumanized by racism and ask for a true humanity realized in your love. We pray for a true peace and justice for all. We pray for our nation. Hear our prayers for those on our prayer list and for ourselves. As we pray in the name of Jesus, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The beginning part of that prayer was adapted from prayers by Martin Luther, the Reformer. Our hymn today is written by Martin Luther, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
God go behind you to protect you. May God go beneath you to support you and beside you as your friend. Do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. And may the blessing of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us all, now and forever. Amen.